Somebody in my YouTube comments recently uh, commented on how many videos I turn out and said, I, I thought for sure you must be doing this full time. And the answer is no, I, I, have, a, I have a day job. I do this in my spare time. Uh, I don't make nearly enough at this to support uh, a teenager living in his parents' basement, never mind, uh, never mind a grown adult with a family. So uh, I don't know uh, what you guys think uh, a 2,000, 3,000 subscriber YouTube channel can earn, but suffice it to say, you, you couldn't live off it. <laughs> you, but anyway, the way I churn out so many videos is that, number one, I like to talk. So, uh, you know, just put the mic up and record. And number two, everything I do, I try to find a way to turn it into a video. And uh, And here's another example of that. My resupply of King Kong props came in the mail. Yay! Oh, King Kong props, never leave me again. Yep, I was able to get my copter back to flying the props it was intended to fly on with these 2633 kV motors. And also, as you'll see in my other video, I broke the bottom plate on my QAV RXL. So I moved all my equipment over to the regular QAV frame, which is an interesting experiment because I had the QAV RXL to like a 90, 95% tune before I ran out of 50, 40 props and had to start using everything else I could find, I could scrounge. And so now this is an example of what a difference the frame will make in the tune because nothing else has changed. The copters, it's about 20, 25 grams lighter and everything is sort of more centralized but the motor to motor distance is the same the motors are the same the props are the same everything else is basically the same so very interesting and since i'm going to be doing this tuning anyway i thought i would just record a video and show it to you so let's get into it as always i look at the gyros first and zoom out to 10 percent and immediately you can see why i always do this even though most of the time there's nothing interesting to see it is very 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 clear that the yaw axis has a problem do you see how this is this has vibrations or oscillations at such a high frequency that instead of a nice thin line, we have a thick squig, squiggle, right? So something is not right with the yaw axis. So let's go look at the yaw axis. And we can immediately see, uh, is the problem that I have excess D gain? No, because the D term is much smaller than the P term. So we do not have a scenario where the D term is freaking out and pulling the P term around. So what does that leave? Well, we see that we have a lot of high frequency spikes in the P term. We have excess P gain on the yaw axis. So let's take a look. What do we got here? Uh, I have a yaw gain of 7.0. Kind of surprised to hear that that's too high. But there we go. Uh, it kind of makes me wonder if I have an out of balance prop or motor, but I don't see a lot of noise on the pitch and roll axes. So it's probably the yaw P gain and we're gonna knock that down. And we're gonna knock that down a good healthy chunk because that is a lot of noise. Let's knock that down. I dare, I'm gonna take it down to 5.0. That's surprisingly low, but there you go. And it does make me wonder if this has something to do with the more compact copter or something. All the copters I have flown up till now have been relatively long compared to this little QAVR or similar in size to the QAV210. Maybe you need less uh, yaw P gain uh, in this scenario. Okay. So we got, just to sum up here, recap, we got a clear case of too much high frequency activity caused by, as evidenced by these sharp spikes here and of course the gyro trace, which you saw. There's, the I term is never going to cause high frequency activity. The I term is always low frequency. So throw that out. So that leaves the D and the P term. Because we see that the D term is basically always lower in magnitude than the P term, and we can say that that's not the cause here. It's not that the D term is flipping out like crazy and pulling the P term around. It's that the P gain is too high. That only leaves one thing. P gain is too high. Okay, so we're going to drop that down. Let's take a look at the roll axis. Let's see what we got here. Now I can look for scenarios where I pump the throttle a little, like here. I start to raise the throttle. Let's watch this play back at real speed. There's a lot going on there. There's a there's a, some throttle pumps during the turn, and then there's a sort of a sliding prop washy turn. 
Let's take a look again and just walk our way through that. Right here, we raise the throttle coming out of the turn. We can see the P-term is surging, I like to call these things, these kind of little cresting waves. It's surging, but it's not oscillating. Good. I like that. That's what I want to see. The D-term is not flipping out. As the throttle goes up, the surging gets higher frequency. Oh, it's building. It's building. It doesn't flip out, though. It's good. Now, here we start to get a little unsettled. That's okay. We're asking a lot. And as I chop the throttle and turn here and go into the prop wash scenario, the P-term becomes very active. We'll watch that at slow speed. Hang on. And here, again, so we see this is almost becoming what you might call oscillation. The P-term is really working to keep up with the prop wash. Again, watch it in slow motion. And watch the copter kind of bobble on the roll axis back and forth as the P-term works to stabilize it. But it does a pretty darn good job, doesn't it? And if we listen to the motors at full speed, we don't hear, I don't think, any sort of uh, oscillations or anything like that. Let's listen. No, it's all pretty good. Listen again. It's all pretty good. This is what I would call an example of a P-term that is active enough without crossing over into the line into, into oscillations. I feel like this is really, so far, very much like I want it to be. Now, if we were to look at a different part of the uh, flight, like here, let's watch the next part of the flight. Notice how relatively inactive the P-term is. And that's because I'm not doing any big stressful moves, right? So, so we can't really judge from that. We wouldn't tune based on that because that's not normally what we're doing. I'm just kind of floating around. Here it's getting active again. Active. Here we're climbing up over the tree. We do some high throttle. Let's watch that. So here we are at a relatively high throttle. How's the P-term looking? Pretty good. It's active. It's surging but it's not oscillating. And if we listen for the kind of characteristic roughness in the motors, the kind of a, a almost a warbling, I like to call it in the motors, if that term means anything to you, uh, that would come from a buildup of oscillations in the P term, we don't hear that, listen. So it's just the tiniest bit of it, of roughness, but, but mostly the motors sound pretty smooth to me. And again, like I always like to say, you got a race car, you're going to squeal the tires. I like to have a little bit of roughness on the edges that makes the copter fly sharply and nicely. What else have we got here? Here again, we're going to a higher throttle. Let's see what happens here. Okay, now there's a backflip, right? Now we're looking at the wrong axis. So let's go over to the pitch axis and see what we see over there. Now. Set that backflip aside for a second. Let's just look at the pitch axis during that climb out and see what we see. Pitch axis is becoming active during this climb out. It's not super active. Maybe it could be a little more active than this, given how extreme the situation we're in. I feel like the P-term may be a little bit sedate for how extreme the situation we're in. D-term looks fine. Looks fine. In fact, D-term is actually a little sedate. Their D-term is very close to the axis, even as, as we get to the higher throttle here, it becomes has more high-frequency noise, but overall, this, the magnitude is not very high. And then as we get to that, oh, so now here, what's going on here? So that's during that move. Let's watch that again at half speed. So that's interesting because I'm not actually asking a lot of the pitch axis here. I think what's happening is that I've chopped the throttle, and so the P-term is having to work harder to just stabilize the copter in the presence of the, you could call it prop wash, but it's just sort of floating through the air. This is good, though. Again, it's we see these surging, but we're not seeing it go into sharp uh, sinusoidal oscillations that would indicate excess P gain.
it's working it's working not now here this is starting to look like what i would call more a sort of oscillations let's see what's happening here though I, let's find out just descending there nothing really extreme we'll watch that with a little more context i'm not going to read too much into that Here we're sliding sideways and we've dropped the throttle. This is, should be a real challenge for the PID controller. No and here comes the flip. So the P-term pushes us hard into the flip. The gyro goes down, the P-term goes down. Notice that as I move the sticks, the I-term is zeroed. I'm still on 241. I believe Boris has changed 25 so that the I-term doesn't zero like this. Unless you Maybe unless you're using Acro Plus, I'm not sure. But I term zeros as I go into the move. P term is working. And as we come out of the move, notice that as the stick centers, oh my goodness, look how good this is. Oh man, there is no overshoot. There is no bounce. This is so great. Oh, I love to see this. I don't mean I don't mean to toot my own horn, but what a pleasure this is to see. Look how the gyro line just neatly comes back to zero as the stick is centered not quite a little bit of delay the stick centers right about there and there's just a few milliseconds of delay here but hey what can, what can you ask so the fact that this within within the move the fact that the p term is kind of sloppy here I'm not too worried about that because ultimately in the middle of the move who cares you're doing a flip Boop, it's over before you know it but this nice smooth ending oh I, that is so satisfying to see and that almost more than anything tells me that i'm pretty close to dead on with my p and my d uh so i think i feel like i'm pretty dialed in here i feel like there's times when the p term looks like it's not active enough but then there's times like this where it looks like it's it's on the edge of too active and maybe needs a little less D, perhaps. But I feel like it's flying really good. Like right here, D term is hardly doing anything. I kind of think maybe D needs to come up. But then you get to over here, it's like, oh, I don't know. This is pretty active and it's on the edge of getting pretty messy. Maybe, I, and I'm not sure what I would, I would really need to fine tweak this and concentrate and try to get that last 1% out of the tune. And I just don't care. It's flying good. I don't have any complaints. One of the things that is, is hard to explain uh, is how I tune eye gain. And it's hard to explain because it's hard to do just from looking at the black box logs. And it's also hard to explain because the eye gain is pretty dialed in, in my opinion, on this one. So there's not a lot of bad examples to show you of what it looks like when it's bad. But just in the interest of trying to be complete, watch this next turn around the birdhouse. And what I want you to notice here is that during that turn, I, sh I sort of sharply spun around to the right, but at no point did the copter roll to the left a little bit when I didn't command it to. It just stayed right pointed where it was supposed to be. If the eye gain on roll was a little too low, then we would expect in a scenario like that, or even if we go back a little bit to this example, hang on, right, like right here, right here as we go through this turn the sort of smooth sliding turns uh, are almost as good for this as the the uh, the sharp turns you would see the copter kind of rock to the outside of the turn a little bit like right there you might expect to see it uh, or maybe as you enter the turn or as you exit the turn uh, basically any time during the turn i guess is what i'm saying you would look for it to rock to the outside of the turn a little bit and that would indicate that you didn't have enough roll eye gain. Here's another example of a turn that I might use to try and tune my eye gain. And in this case, I might look at the pitch attitude of the copter and look for the nose to kind of wobble up and down as I go through the turn. Check this out. Now you see how as the copter moved through that turn, the nose stayed really steady and it didn't sort of wobble up and down as it was fighting its way through the turn. That means that my eye gain on pitch is about right, or it's not too low anyway.
Alrighty, well, I guess I've talked for about 15 minutes. Let's call that good. I feel like this tune is pretty good, except for the adjustments on yaw gain, yaw P gain. I feel like it's pretty much where I want it to be. I don't think I'm going to change very much at all. There are a few, I, th I feel like I'm like, if I had to give it a number, I'm within about 3% of a perfect tune. You know, I'm really close. And any, any additional gains I might make would be sort of gains of inches, for which I would have to do a lot of work of tweaking this and seeing if it made this better, but that worse. Uh, I feel like it's pretty close to where I want it to be. So sometimes people ask, what is a, what does a good copter trace look like to you? And I guess this is uh, close to an example of it. Uh, give, me, give me 24 hours and I'll come up with something I don't like and want to change. But for now, I feel like this is pretty good. Hope that's helpful and happy flying.